Hey, welcome back to our channel. So let's continue Sophie's world. The Major's Cabin. The girl in the mirror winked with both eyes. It was only a quarter past seven. There was no need to hurry home. Sophie's. Mother always took it easy on Sundays, so she would probably sleep for another two. Hours. Should she go a bit farther into the woods and try to find Alberto Knox? And. Why had the dog snarled at her so viciously? Sophie got up and began to walk down the path Hermes had taken. She had the brown envelope with the pages on Plato in her hand. Wherever the path diverged she took the wider one. Birds were chirping everywhere, in the trees and in the air, in bush and thicket. They were busily occupied with their morning pursuits. They knew no difference between weekdays and Sundays. Who had taught them to do all that? Was there a tiny computer inside each one of them, programming them to do certain things? The path led up over a little hill, then steeply down between tall pine trees. The woods were so dense now that she could only see a few yards between the trees. Suddenly she caught sight of something glittering between the pine trunks. It must be a little lake. The path went the other way, but Sophie picked her way among the trees. Without really knowing why, she let her feet lead her. The lake was no bigger than a soccer field. Over on the other side she could see a red-painted cabin in a small clearing surrounded by silver birches. A faint wisp of smoke was rising from the chimney. Sophie went down to the water's edge. It was very muddy in many places, but then she noticed a rowboat, it was drawn halfway out of the water. There was a pair of oars in it. Sophie looked around. Whatever she did, it would be impossible to get around. The lake to the red cabin, without getting her shoes soaked. She went resolutely over to the boat and pushed it into the water. Then she climbed aboard, set the oars in the rowlocks, and rowed across the lake. The boat soon touched the opposite bank. Sophie went ashore and tried to pull the boat up after her. The bank was much steeper here than the opposite bank had been. She glanced over her shoulder only once before walking up toward the cabin. She was quite startled at her own boldness. How did she dare do this? She had no idea. It was as if something impelled her. Sophie went up to the door and knocked. She waited a while, but nobody answered. She tried the handle cautiously, and the door opened. Hello, she called. Is anyone at home? She went in and found herself in a living room. She dared not shut the door. Behind her, somebody was obviously living here. Sophie could hear wood crackling in the old stove. Someone had been here very recently. On a big dining table stood a typewriter, some books, a couple of pencils, and a pile of paper. A smaller table and two chairs stood by the window that overlooked the lake. Apart from that there was very little furniture, although the whole of one wall was lined with bookshelves filled with books. Above a white chest of drawers hung a large round mirror in a heavy brass frame. It looked very old. On one of the walls hung two pictures. One was an oil painting of a white house, which lay a stone's throw from a little bay with a red boathouse. Between the house and the boathouse was a sloping garden with an apple tree, a few thick bushes, and some rocks. A dense fringe of birch trees framed the garden like a garland. The title of the painting was Berkeley. Beside that painting hung an old portrait of a man sitting in a chair by a window. He had a book in his lap. This picture also had a little bay with trees and rocks in the background. It looked as though it had been painted several hundred years ago. The title of the picture was Berkeley. The painter's name was Smybert. Berkeley and Berkeley. How strange. Sophie continued her investigation. A door led from the living room to a small kitchen. Someone had just done the dishes. Plates and glasses were piled on a tea 
towel, some of them still glistening with drops of soapy water. There was a tin bowl. On the floor with some leftover scraps of food in it. Whoever lived here had a pet, a dog or a cat. Sophie went back to the living room. Another door led to a tiny bedroom. On the floor next to the bed, there were a couple of blankets in a thick bundle. Sophie Dis covered some golden hairs on the blankets. Here was the evidence. Now Sophie knew that the occupants of the cabin were Alberto Knox and Hermes. Back in the living room, Sophie stood in front of the mirror. The glass was mad and scratched, and her reflection correspondingly blurred. Sophie began to make faces at herself like she did at home in the bathroom. Her reflection did exactly the same, which was only to be expected. But all of a sudden something scary happened. Just once, in the space of a split. Second, Sophie saw quite clearly that the girl in the mirror winked with both eyes. Sophie started back in fright. If she herself had winked, how could she have seen the other girl wink? And not only that, it seemed as though the other girl had winked at. Sophie as if to say, I can see you, Sophie. I am in here, on the other side. Sophie felt her heart beating, and at the same time she heard a dog barking in the distance. Hermes, she had to get out of here at once. Then she noticed a green wallet on the chest of drawers under the mirror. It contained a hundred crown note, a 50, and a school ID card. It showed a picture of a girl with fair hair. Under the picture was the girl's name, Hilda Mahler Nag. Sophie shivered. Again she heard the dog bark. She had to get out, at once. As she hurried past the table, she noticed a white envelope between all the books and the pile of paper. It had one word written on it, Sophie. Before she had time to realize what she was doing, she grabbed the envelope and stuffed it into the brown envelope with the Play-Doh pages. Then she rushed out of the door and slammed it behind her. The barking was getting closer. But worst of all was that the boat was gone. After a second or two, she saw it, adrift halfway across the lake. One of the oars was floating beside it. All, because she hadn't been able to pull it completely up on land. She heard the dog barking quite nearby now, and saw movements between the trees on the other side of the lake. Sophie didn't hesitate any longer. With the big envelope in her hand, she plunged into the bushes, behind the cabin. Soon she was having to wade through. Marshy ground, sinking in several times to well above her ankles. But she had to keep going she had to get home. Presently, she stumbled onto a path. Was it the path she had taken earlier? She stopped to wring out her dress. And then she began to cry. How could she have been so stupid? The worst of all was the boat. She couldn't forget the sight of the rowboat with the one or drifting helplessly on the lake. It was also embarrassing, so shameful. The philosophy teacher had probably reached the lake, by now. He would need the boat to get home. Sophie felt almost like a criminal. But she hadn't done it on purpose. The envelope. That was probably even worse. Why had she taken it? Because her name was on it, of course, so in a way it was hers. But even so, she felt like a thief. And what's more, she had provided the evidence that it was she who had been, there. Sophie drew the note out of the envelope. It said, what came first, the chicken, or the idea chicken? Are we born with innate ideas? What is the difference between a plant, an animal, and a human? Why does it rain? What does it take to live a good life? Sophie couldn't possibly think about these questions right now, but she assumed they had something to do with the next philosopher. Wasn't he called Aristotle? When she finally saw the hedge after running so far through the woods it was, like swimming ashore after a shipwreck. The hedge looked funny from the other side. 
She didn't look at her watch until she had crawled into the den. It was 10.30. She put the big envelope into the biscuit tin with the other papers and stuffed the note. With the new questions down her tights. Her mother was on the telephone when she came in. When she saw Sophie, she hung up quickly. Where on earth have you been? I went for a walk in the woods, she stammered. So I see. Sophie stood silently, watching the water dripping from her dress. I called Joanna. Joanna? Her mother brought her some dry clothes. Sophie only just managed to hide the philosopher's note. Then they sat together in the kitchen, and her mother made some hot chocolate. Were you with him? She asked after a while. Him? Sophie could only think about her philosophy teacher. With him, yes. Him. Your rabbit. Sophie shook her head. What do you do when you're together, Sophie? Why are you so wet? Sophie sat staring gravely at the table, but deep down inside she was laughing. Poor mom, now she had that to worry about. She shook her head again. Then more questions came raining down on her. Now I want the truth. Were you out all night? Why did you go to bed with? Your clothes on? Did you sneak out as soon as I had gone to bed? You're only 14, Sophie. I demand to know who you are seeing. Sophie started to cry. Then she talked. She was still frightened, and when you are frightened you usually talk she explained that she had woken up very early and had gone for a walk in the woods. She told her mother about the cabin and the boat, and about the mysterious mirror. But she mentioned nothing about the secret correspondence course. Neither. Did she mention the green wallet? She didn't quite know why, but she had to keep Hilda for herself. Her mother put her arms around Sophie, and Sophie knew that her mother believed her now. I don't have a boyfriend, Sophie sniffed. It was just something I said because you were so upset about the white rabbit. And you really went all the way to the major's cabin, said her mother. Thoughtfully. The major's cabin? Sophie stared at her mother. The little woodland cabin is called the major's cabin because some years ago, an army major lived there for a time. He was rather eccentric, a little crazy, I think. But never mind that. Since then the cabin has been unoccupied. But it isn't. There's a philosopher living there now. Oh stop, don't start fantasizing again. Sophie stayed in her room, thinking about what had happened. Her head felt like a roaring circus full of lumbering elephants, silly clowns, daring trapeze flyers, and trained monkeys. But one image recurred unceasingly, a small rowboat with one or drifting in a lake deep in the woods, and someone needing the boat to get home. She felt sure that the philosophy teacher didn't wish her any harm, and would certainly forgive her if he knew she had been to his cabin. But she had broken an agreement. That was all the thanks he got for taking on her philosophic education. How could she make up for it? Sophie took out her pink notepaper and began to write. Dear philosopher, it was me who was in your cabin early Sunday morning. I wanted so much to meet you and discuss some of the philosophic problems. For the moment I am a Plato fan, but I am not so sure he was right about ideas or pattern. Pictures existing in another reality. Of course they exist in our souls, but I think, for the moment anyway, that this is a different thing, I have to admit too that I am not altogether convinced of the immortality of the soul. Personally, I have no recollections from my former lives. If you could convince me that my deceased grandmother's soul is happy in the world of ideas, I would be most grateful. Actually, it was not for philosophic reasons that I started to write this letter, which I shall put in a pink envelope with a lump of sugar. I just wanted to say I was sorry for being disobedient. I tried to pull the boat completely up on shore, but I was obviously not strong enough.
or perhaps a big wave dragged the boat out again. I hope you managed to get home without getting your feet wet. If not, it might. Comfort you to know that I got soaked and will probably have a terrible cold. But. That'll be my own fault. I didn't touch anything in the cabin, but I am sorry to say that I couldn't resist. The temptation to take the envelope that was on the table. It wasn't because I wanted to steal anything, but as my name was on it, I thought in my confusion that it belonged to me. I am really and truly sorry, and I promise never to disappoint you again. P.S. I will think all the new questions through very carefully, starting now. P.P.S. Is the mirror with the brass frame above the white chest of drawers an ordinary mirror or a magic mirror? I'm only asking because I am not used to seeing my own reflection wink with both eyes. With regards from your sincerely interested pupil, Sophie. Sophie read the letter through twice before she put it in the envelope. She thought it was less formal than the previous letter she had written. Before she went downstairs to the kitchen to get a lump of sugar, she looked at the note with the days. Questions. What came first, the chicken or the idea chicken? This question was just as tricky as the old riddle of the chicken and the egg. There would be no chicken without the egg, and no egg without the chicken. Was it? Really just as complicated to figure out whether the chicken or the idea chicken came first? Sophie understood what Plato meant. He meant that the idea chicken had existed in the world of ideas long before chickens existed in the sensory world. According to Plato, the soul had seen the idea chicken before it took up residence in a body. But wasn't this just where Sophie thought Plato must be mistaken? How could a person who had never seen a live chicken or a picture of a chicken ever have any idea of a chicken? Which brought her to the next question. Are we born with innate ideas? Most unlikely, thought Sophie. She could hardly imagine a newborn baby being especially well equipped with ideas. One could obviously never be sure, because the fact that the baby had no language did not necessarily mean that it had no ideas in its head. But surely we have to see things in the world before we can know anything about them. What is the difference between a plant, an animal, and a human? Sophie could immediately see very clear differences. For instance, she did not think a plant had a very complicated emotional life. Who had ever heard of a bluebell with a broken heart? A plant grows, takes nourishment, and produces seeds so that it can reproduce itself. That's about all one could say about plants, Sophie concluded that everything that applied to plants also applied to animals and humans. But animals had other attributes as well. They could move, for example. When did a rose ever run a marathon? It was a bit harder to point to any differences between animals and humans. Humans could think, but couldn't animals do so as well? Sophie was convinced that her cat Shuriken could think. At least, it could be very calculating. But could it reflect on philosophical questions? Could a cat speculate about the difference between a plant, an animal, and a human? Hardly. A cat could probably be either contented or unhappy, but did it ever ask itself if there was a god or whether it had an immortal soul? Sophie thought that was extremely doubtful. But the same problem was raised here as with the baby, and the innate ideas. It was just as difficult to talk to a cat about such questions as it would be to discuss them with a baby. Why does it rain? Sophie shrugged her shoulders. It probably rains because seawater evaporates and the clouds condense into raindrops. Hadn't she learned that in the third grade? Of course, one could always say that it rains so that plants and animals can grow. But was that true? Had a shower any actual purpose? The last question definitely had something to do with purpose, what does it take to live a good life? The philosopher had written something about this quite early on in the course. 
Everybody needs food, warmth, love, and care. Such basics were the primary condition for a good life, at any rate. Then he had pointed out that people also needed to find answers to certain philosophical questions. It was probably also quite important to have a job you liked. If you hated traffic, for instance, you would not be very happy as a taxi driver. And if you hated doing homework, it would probably be a bad idea to become a teacher. Sophie loved animals and wanted to be a vet. But in any case she didn't think it was necessary to win a million in the lottery to live a good life. Quite the opposite, more likely. There was a saying. The devil finds work for idle hands. Sophie stayed in her room until her mother called her down to a big midday meal. She had prepared sirloin steak and baked potatoes. There were cloudberries and cream for dessert. They talked about all kinds of things. Sophie's mother asked her how she wanted to celebrate her 15th birthday. It was only a few weeks away. Sophie shrugged. Aren't you going to invite anyone? I mean, don't you want to have a party? Maybe. We could ask Martha and Anne Marie, and Helen. And Joanna, of course. And Jeremy, perhaps. But that's for you to decide. I remember my own 15th birthday so clearly, you know, it doesn't seem all that long ago. I felt I was already quite grown up. Isn't it odd, Sophie? I don't feel I have changed at all since then. You haven't. Nothing changes. You have just developed, gotten older. Mim, that was a very grown-up thing to say. I just think it's all happened so. Very quickly. Aristotle. A meticulous organizer who wanted to clarify our concepts. While her mother was taking her afternoon nap, Sophie went down to the den. She had put a lump of sugar in the pink envelope and written, to Alberto, on the outside. There was no new letter, but after a few minutes, Sophie heard the dog. Approaching. Hermes, she called, and the next moment he had pushed his way into the den. With a big brown envelope in his mouth. Good boy. Sophie put her arm around the dog, which was snorting, and. Snuffling like a walrus. She took the pink envelope with the lump of sugar and put it in the dog's mouth. He crawled through the hedge and made off into the woods again. Sophie opened the big envelope apprehensively, wondering whether it would contain anything about the cabin and the boat. It contained the usual typed pages held together with a paper clip. But there was also a loose page inside. On it was written, Dear Miss Sleuth, or, to be more exact, Miss Burglar. The case has already been handed over to the police. Not really. No, I'm not angry. If you are just as curious when it comes to discovering answers to the riddles of philosophy, I'd say your adventure was very promising. It's just a little annoying that I'll have to move now. Still, I have no one to blame but myself, I suppose. I might have known you were a person who would always want to get to the bottom of things. Greetings, Alberto. Sophie was relieved. So he was not angry after all. But why would he have to move? She took the papers and ran up to her room. It would be prudent to be in the house when her mother woke up. Lying comfortably on her bed, she began to read about Aristotle philosopher and scientist. Dear Sophie, you were probably astonished by Plato's theory or ideas. You are not the only one, I do not know whether you swallowed the whole thing, hook, line, and sinker, or whether you had any critical comments. But, if you did have, you can be sure that the self-same criticism was raised by Aristotle, 384 to 322 BC who was a pupil at Plato's Academy for almost 20 years. Aristotle was not a native of Athens. He was born in Macedonia and came to Plato's Academy when Plato was 61. Aristotle's father was a respected physician and therefore a scientist. 
this background already tells us something about Aristotle's philosophic project. What he was most interested in was nature study. He was not only the last of the great Greek philosophers, he was Europe's first great biologist. Taking it to extremes, we could say that Plato was so engrossed in his eternal forms or ideas that he took very little notice of the changes in nature. Aristotle, on the other hand, was preoccupied with just these changes, or with what we nowadays describe as natural processes. To exaggerate even more, we could say that Plato turned his back on the sensory world and shut his eyes to everything we see around us. He wanted to escape from the cave and look out over the eternal world of ideas. Aristotle did the opposite, he got down on all fours and studied frogs and fish, anemones and poppies. While Plato used his reason, Aristotle used his senses as well. We find decisive differences between the two, not least in their writing. Plato was a poet and mythologist, Aristotle's writings were as dry and precise as an encyclopedia. On the other hand, much of what he wrote was based on up-to-the-minute field studies. Records from antiquity refer to 170 titles supposedly written by Aristotle. Of these, 47 are preserved. These are not complete books, they consist largely of lecture notes. In his time, philosophy was still mainly an oral activity. The significance of Aristotle in European culture is due not least to the fact that he created the terminology that scientists use today. He was the great organizer who founded and classified the various sciences. Since Aristotle wrote on all the sciences, I will limit myself to some of the most important areas. Now that I have told you such a lot about Plato, you must start by hearing how Aristotle refuted Plato's theory of ideas. Later we will look at the way he formulated his own natural philosophy, since it was Aristotle who summed up what the natural philosophers before him had said. We'll see how he categorizes our concepts and founds the discipline of logic as a science. And finally, I'll tell you a little about Aristotle's view of man and society. No innate ideas. Like the philosophers before him, Plato wanted to find the eternal and immutable in the midst of all change, so he found the perfect ideas that were superior to the sensory world. Plato furthermore held that ideas were more real than all the phenomena of nature. First came the idea horse, then came all the sensory world's horses trotting along like shadows on a cave wall. The idea chicken came before both the chicken and the egg. Aristotle thought Plato had turned the whole thing upside down. He agreed with his teacher that the particular horse flows and that no horse lives forever. He also agreed that the actual form of the horse is eternal and immutable. But the idea horse was simply a concept that we humans had formed after seeing a certain number of horses. The idea or form horse thus had no existence of its own. To Aristotle, the idea or the form horse was made up of the horse's characteristics, which define what we today call the horse species. To be more precise, by form horse, Aristotle meant that which is common to all horses. And here the metaphor of the gingerbread mold does not hold up because the mold exists independently of the particular gingerbread cookies. Aristotle did not believe in the existence of any such molds or forms that, as it were, lay on their own shelf beyond the natural world. On the contrary, to Aristotle, the forms were in the things because they were the particular characteristics of these things. So Aristotle disagreed with Plato that the idea chicken came before the chicken. What Aristotle called the form chicken is present in every single chicken as the chicken's particular set characteristics, for one, that it lays eggs, the real chicken and the form chicken are thus just as inseparable as body and soul. And that is really the essence of Aristotle's criticism of Plato's theory of ideas. 
but you should not ignore the fact that this was a dramatic turn of thought. The highest degree of reality, in Plato's theory, was that which we think with our reason. It was equally apparent to Aristotle that the highest degree of reality is that which we perceive with our senses. Plato thought that all the things we see in the natural world were purely reflections of things that existed in the higher reality of the world of ideas, and thereby in the human soul. Aristotle thought the opposite, things that are in the human soul were purely reflections of natural objects. So nature is the real world. According to Aristotle, Plato was trapped in a mythical world picture in which the human imagination was confused with the real world. Aristotle pointed out that nothing exists in consciousness that has not first been experienced by the senses. Plato would have said that there is nothing in the natural world that has not first existed in the world of ideas. Aristotle held that Plato was thus doubling the number of things. He explained a horse by referring to the idea horse. But what kind of an explanation is that, Sophie? Where does the idea horse come from, is my question. Might there not even be a third horse, which the idea horse is just an imitation of? Aristotle held that all our thoughts and ideas have come into our consciousness through what we have heard and seen. But we also have an innate power of reason, we have no innate ideas, as Plato held, but we have the innate faculty of organizing all sensory impressions into categories and classes. This is how concepts such as stone, plant, animal, and human arise. Similarly, there arise concepts like horse, lobster, and canary. Aristotle did not deny that humans have innate reason. On the contrary, it is precisely reason, according to Aristotle, that is man's most distinguishing characteristic. But our reason is completely empty until we have sensed something, so man has no innate ideas. The form of a thing is its specific characteristics. Having come to terms with Plato's theory of ideas, Aristotle decided that reality consisted of various separate things that constitute a unity of form and substance. The substance is what things are made of, while the form is each thing's specific characteristics. A chicken is fluttering about in front of you, Sophie. The chicken's form is precisely that it flutters and that it cackles and lays eggs. So by the form of a chicken, we mean the specific characteristics of its species, or in other words, what it does. When the chicken dies and cackles no more, its form ceases to exist. The only thing that remains is the chicken's substance. Sadly enough, Sophie, but then it is no longer a chicken. As I said earlier, Aristotle was concerned with the changes in nature. Substance always contains the potentiality to realize a specific form. We could say that substance always strives toward achieving an innate potentiality. Every change in nature, according to Aristotle, is a transformation of substance from the potential to the actual. Yes, I'll explain what I mean, Sophie. See if this funny story helps you. A. Sculptor is working on a large block of granite. He hacks away at the formless block every day. One day a little boy comes by and says, what are you looking for? Wait and see, answers the sculptor. After a few days, the little boy comes back, and now the sculptor has carved a beautiful horse out of the granite. The boy stares at it in amazement, then he turns to the sculptor, and says, how did you know it was in there? How indeed? In a sense, the sculptor had seen the horse's form in the block of granite, because that particular block of granite had the potentiality to be formed into the shape or a horse. Similarly Aristotle believed that Everything in nature has the potentiality of realizing, or achieving, a specific form. Let us return to the chicken and the egg. A chicken's egg has the potentiality to become a chicken. 
This does not mean that all chicken's eggs become chickens, many of them end up on the breakfast table as fried eggs, omelets, or scrambled eggs, without ever having realized their potentiality. But it is equally obvious that a chicken's egg cannot become a goose. That potentiality is not within a chicken's egg. The form of a thing, then, says something about its limitation as well as its potentiality. When Aristotle talks about the substance and form of things, he does not only refer to living organisms, just as it is the chicken's form to cackle, flutter its wings, and lay eggs, it is the form of the stone to fall to the ground. Just as the chicken cannot help cackling, the stone cannot help falling to the ground. You can, of course, lift a stone and hurl it high into the air, but because it is the stone's nature to fall to the ground, you cannot hurl it to the moon. Take care when you perform this experiment, because the stone might take revenge and find the shortest route back to the earth. So thank you for watching see you in next video.